welcome to a special summer episode of Prosecco and Prose. This week's Prosecco is, well, it's something a little harder than what we're used to. Amy, you made us your mother's recipe, which is a beachy brandy slush topped off with the Prosecco Lunetta. Mmm. It's so good. It is. Mom's going to love that we double dipped it with a good bottle of Prosecco. I think Lunetta is going to be one of my new favorites. It's good. I mean... Mixed in with this brandy, it's very good. We are Prosecco and Pros. We are. Mm-hmm. Oh, hey, I almost forgot to share <laughs> that this week's prose is a beachy read. When Life Gives You Lululemons by Lauren Weisberger. This is going to be interesting <laughs> because we are Prosecco and Pros, so we have to have the pros as well. Exactly. Exactly. But this brandy is going to make it interesting. It's going to be a great episode. Thank you for joining us for an episode of Prosecco and Pros. I'm Wendy. And I'm Amy. This is a deep dive virtual book club hosted by two English teachers and army wives who love to read and love the bubbly. In each episode, we will feature a discussion on a novel from our local DC Metro book club. Or we will chat about some of the latest and greatest pieces of prose. We will also answer questions our listeners send us in our sparkling wine box. (laughs) She said sparkling wine box, what an oxymoron. So sit back and pop a cork for this week's episode of Prosecco and Prose. For those of you who are listening in the car, please don't drink and drive. Save the bubbly for later. In this episode, we will discuss Lauren Weisberger's When Life Gives You Lululemons, which was published on June 5th, 2018. Miss Weisberger is from Scranton and Allentown, Pennsylvania. She has lived and worked in New York and currently resides in Connecticut. She traveled around the world working for both Vogue and Departure magazines and has written several New York Times bestseller novels. She is best known for her novel, The Devil Wears Prada, which was later turned into a movie. Ah, I loved that movie. That scene in Paris when Andy takes her phone and throws it into the fountain. Mm. It's so amazing. I love it. If you have not read this summary beach read yet and do not want spoilers, Please stop this episode and come back to us when you have finished Weisberger's novel. It's a quick read, and it's fun. So, Wendy, we were supposed to discuss this pick at our local DC book club earlier in the year. However, the COVID-19 and social distancing sort of got in the way of a girl's night out. It did. I know you read this book before I did, so will you share with our friends how you heard about it? Sure. As I mentioned, I absolutely love the movie um, Devil Wears Prada. So when this book popped up on a suggested list, I think I think it was in a magazine I was reading. I put it on my never-ending list of books to read. I think you have that same list. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was a fun, it was an easy read. Uh, it was one of my first on a summer break last year that I read, actually. And those of you who have seen The Devil Wears Prada, you'll recognize a couple of the characters and I especially love the chapter titles I know you did too weren't they fun oh they were so fun um but since we will go into these more later I'm not going to spoil that for our friends now okay so the chapter titles were of interest to me and aided in a more deliberate read yeah I remember when you said that I totally missed that I have to tell you they were like little happiness surprises that you find in your car when you're driving like those drop skittles or sweet tarts, or on a good day, a piece of beef jerky. (laughs) (laughs) Well, let's get stranded in your car. (laughs) Absolutely. But I closely read each chapter in search of its respective title. You know, I'm a huge fan of the close read. It's just so exciting. It's kind of like this slushy drink. Slushy drink is delicious. Thanks, mom. (laughs) Yes, thanks. And I had not noticed it till you said that, yeah, guys, if you're out there reading it, Look at the chapter title and see where it pops up. Now, I know it doesn't take much to get you going. (laughs) Nope. But that was a lot of fun doing that when I reread the book. So Miss Weisberger alternates the chapter structure of the novel between her three main characters. There's Emily, Miriam, and most of you will know Emily from The Devil Wears Prada. Yes. And Carolina. Each of these leading ladies has her own storyline, too. However, they all three work together to clear Carolina's name. 
Carolina's chump of a senator mm. husband framed her. He sounds so delightful. Son of a gun. So he could date former President Whitney's daughter and hope to clinch the 2020 presidency. Well, I read the hard copy and listened via Audible. You know, whenever there's a book that alternates characters like this one did, I also like to read each character's storyline separately after an initial cover-to-cover -cover read. It really helps me focus on the pattern of the story arc. That's an interesting take. I mm -hmm. didn't even think of reading it that way. I do it all the time. I can read a book five and six times. It's crazy. <laughs> That's good. But there was this great article on the Google Webs in a July 2016 copy of Discover Magazine. It was written by Nathaniel Sharping. It was entitled, Six Story Arcs Define Western Literature Data Mining Study Reveals. And it looked into how the University of Vermont use technology to show that stories fall into uh, like six distinctive paths. That is interesting. Yeah. The rags to riches. Okay. Man in a hole. Mm -hmm. The Cinderella path. Okay. The tragedy, the Oedipus, and the Icarus path. So what path do you think Lululemons fell into? Okay. Well, it's definitely not the tragedy, Oedipus, or Icarus paths, mm -mm. as those all of those end in failure, and that did not happen here. But it's not a rags to riches either. No. So I'm going to go with either the man in the hole or the Cinderella story. What are your thoughts, Amy? Well, Wendy, I felt that um, it was the man in the hole path, okay. as both Emily and Carolina's fortunes fell in the beginning. You could even uh, stretch and say that Miriam's fortune fell as she gave up her love of being a career woman she gained weight and felt if her husband Paul was having an affair. Too much time on her hands to worry about problems that just really weren't there. Mm -hmm. But everyone seems to bounce back in the end, especially Emily, the protagonist. I don't think it fits very well in the Cinderella story, as there is no initial good rise in fortune. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Let's call it the man in the hole path. Yeah. No pun intended. As there is a little bit of sex in this story, <laughs> but nothing too risque. I mean, didn't you say your mom read it? Yeah, she did. She did read it. It's truly not her interest level of novels. But, you know, she is a supporter of our virtual book club from afar. What about Aunt Dot? Oh, Aunt Dot. She prefers to listen to us. She feels that's better than reading the book. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> so let's move on to a brief summary of the novel's events, just in case our friends haven't read the book yet. Or just maybe need a little bit of a refresher. Okay. In the exposition, we are introduced to the main characters of Emily, Miriam, and Carolina. We learn that the ever-beautiful Emily, who is an agent to the stars, has been called to New York on New Year's Eve to help pop star Rizzo out of an anti-Semitic costume mishap. But after she gets to New York City, she is fired before being hired and loses her potential client to her nemesis. Olivia Bell, the internet sensation and the much younger agent. And maybe more seemingly attuned to the needs of the stars. The conflict is introduced here with Emily, who has lost several of her, this isn't the first one, of her clientele to Olivia Bell. She is at a loss as she does not want to even consider going back to runway to work for Miranda Priestly or for someone else. She likes her independence, but she's frustrated and she needs a new gig. So... The down-and-out Emily decides to stick around in the area and travel to Greenwich, Connecticut, which is in close proximity to New York City. She goes to see her old friend Miriam, who has moved to the Burbs after her husband Paul struck it rich by selling his startup business. Miriam has become, in her mind, a daddy housewife and walked away from her job as a New York City lawyer to focus on raising her kids. She becomes a little insecure with the ways of the burbs and often wonders if Paul is cheating on her. Well, if she wouldn't project everyone else's issues onto her own life. But Weisberger does develop her character as an insecure stay-at-home mom. But we then learn that the third friend, the former model Carolina Hartwell, now wife to Senator Graham Hartwell, has been arrested for a DUI after having... A half a glass of wine. Smells like a setup to me. Oh, it's definitely fishy. 
So she is now hiding out from the paparazzi in Connecticut and away from her family, volunteer duties, and friends. She suspects her husband is having an affair with former President Whitney's daughter, Reagan. Carolina has a problem, and Emily is a problem solver. Mm -hmm. So the three ladies, Emily, Miriam, and Carolina, formulate a plan to clear Carolina's name and help her maintain a closeness with her stepson, Harry, her only child. We learn that she has not been able to conceive children of her own. No. Nope. So Emily, she wants to come in. She wants to totally transform Carolina's image. Make her a little more momish. Mm -hmm. You know, take off a little bit of that model shine. We later learn that another part of the plan is to arrange an undercover spa week in lieu of alcohol rehab. Because everyone knows a sincere, contrite stay in rehab does wonders for a celebrity's image. It's a sneaky plan, but a great idea by Emily to gain public sympathies on the side of Carolina. Excellent. I mean, I'll take a stay in a spa. Mm, me too. If that would help my public image. <laughs> we don't have public images yet. Oh, well, we will. And let's go to a spa to help them. Okay. So we progress through the rising action of the story, and we as the reader are invited to a slew of events. A suburban baby shower. A sex toy party. A swinger-type fancy soiree. An over-the-top kid birthday party. And brunch, where nothing but cosmetic surgery is the topic of choice. We also learn that the good senator is indeed courting mm. Reagan Whitney and devising his plan to cut Carolina out of the picture. But the trio of friends stick together and work towards a means to an end. We learn that Senator Hartwell has had several affairs in the past, duh, mm. a vasectomy hmm, five years ago, and was the driver of an accident that resulted in the death of a four-year-old when he was 17. Now, mind you, this murderous event was kept out of the spotlight. Ah, what money can buy. Oh, yes. Definitely, this was a secret that was swept far under the rug. Of course, no good Weisberger story would leave out the ever-powerful Miranda, and she still is on Emily's back to return to runway. She knows Emily is not doing well in her business. But Emily tells her of the Carolina situation and how once she solves it, she will be back in play with her I, business. I just knew Emily would solve this problem, <laughs> but... You know, after spilling the details to Miranda in an effort to turn down working for her, hmm, hmm. Miranda skillfully turns the tables, flying in on her broomstick, handles the senator, reminding him of her powerful connection to uh, President Whitney. A couple buttons to press right there. Yep. And now, presto, Emily is working for Miranda again. Carolina lands her role back as Harry's mother and primary caregiver, which was what she wanted the most. Her name is cleared, and she even ends up with the job at Runway. Reagan Whitney dumps the senator as Carolina discloses to her that, hey, you might want to know that Graham's had a vasectomy. And then the death, the death of the four-year-old is also featured in the news. And don't we know about the news? Don't we know about the news? Graham, finished. Finito. Bye-bye, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Graham. Oh, and he even tries to worm his way <sighs> back to Carolina, but she rejects him. Good girl. Good girl. Cheers to that, Carolina. Mm -hmm. Have a little brandy slush for that. That's right. Miriam, she goes back to work part-time as Paul has been quietly working to secure office space for her to continue practicing law. Miriam is happy that there was no affair, and Paul is just trying to secretly give her her life back as a lawyer. She is satisfied and ends up losing all of her burbs' weight. So Emily's initial conflict that you mentioned in the beginning, remember... Finding the new gig is now resolved, as in any good story plot. The problem solver, Emily, has gained back a few big names in the industry, but not without a little bit of surprise. She is the one who focuses most on looks and never wanted kids, ends up pregnant and very large. Like double burger eaten large? I'm kind of having visions of a recent episode of Uncle Sean Large. Not that large, <laughs> but... All ends well for the trio of friends. So much more happens in this story, but we can discuss some of the more eventful instances as we cover characters, themes, and symbols in the novel. So I, Amy, I think a good place to start, how about, let's start with the main characters and the relationships with their spouses. Let's start with Emily and Miles. Okay. 
I felt like Emily was an opportunist. Uh, obviously. Mm -hmm. And in the story, Miles is her biggest fan. They are an L.A. party couple who live life on the edge and to the fullest. Emily portrays her and Miles as the perfect couple with a strong marriage. They are invited to trendy parties and openly flirt with others. Hey, but no issues, as Emily tells everyone that their relationship is solid. Hmm. Well, but we as the reader, we're privy to info Emily's friends are not. Exactly. Our story opens with Miles frolicking with a young girl in a barely there bikini on his shoulders in a pool. Emily calls to him and says, Miles, love, can you please move her thighs away from your ears for 30 seconds? I have to leave. Miles asks if she's mad, but Emily tells him, ah, of course not. I'm not mad. If you're going to cheat on me, you better pick someone a hell of a lot hotter than that. Hmm. I'm not sure I would be so blasé about mm -mm. that. And, I mean, Emily becomes a topic of rumors in Greenwich when, with her run-ins with Alistair, a handsome divorcee. That's right. First, she flirted with Alistair on the train back to the mm -hmm. Burbs. Then, Emily runs into him at the swinger soiree. Remember they kissed when they were hiding in the bathroom? Yes. Her husband, Miles, calls later. And... Of course, she ignores his call. And what about when she sent Alistar the photoshopped boob pic out of spite after she sent it to Miles because Miles only replied with a thumbs up emoji? Right. But Alistar doesn't even respond. Even more insulting, eh? <laughs> For sure. <laughs> I mean, I have to give her something there. That, that would be insulting. But Emily and Miles definitely prioritize their relationship. She flies back to LA whenever he's home from a trip. Yep, he flew back from Hong Kong just to be able to spend a few hours with her in Greenwich, even though he slept <laughs> for most of the vacation. Right, yeah. they And they do have tons of spontaneous sex whenever they are together. Yes, they do. But on a more serious note, we learn that Miles has subtly been pressuring her to have a child. Emily has no desire as she feels kids complicate things. Yeah. So it's so interesting when Emily finds out she is pregnant at the end of our novel she knows Miles will be over the moon, and we do see Miles catering to her by grabbing her a double burger from Shake Shack as she sits on the couch with bloated cankles. Emily's marriage is, it's in a good place. So ironic, though, that she now is the one who really doesn't care about what goes into her mouth <laughs> and is the one who's, you know, excited about having a child. I really wasn't expecting that. Uh, not, not for a second, I wasn't. So... Let's move on to Miriam and Paul. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, these two, you know, outside looking in, seem to have a pretty good relationship with three kids and a beautiful home. Miriam feels, though, like she has this monologue going on in her head. She feels she's become frumpy, so she tries to get into an exercise routine, but she truly defeats the purpose with bagels, pancakes, lots of cheese, and whatever leftovers are on her kids' plates. I so love cheese. Oh, how can you not? Mm. But we do learn that Paul um, made bank after selling his internet startup. So he loaded up the truck and he moved to Beverly Hills, that is. Swimming pools, movie stars. Uh, Amy, don't you mean Greenwich, Connecticut? You're talking Paul, not Jen. Oh yeah, wrong generation, wrong storyline. Love to break out in song though. Maybe it's the Brandy Slush. Uh. Probably. Mm. Probably. Oh, my. Miriam is... She's generally happy, do you think? Mm -hmm. She's generally happy with her life and... I had she, a mouthful of brownie slush. Sorry. <laughs> can't ask me a question when I'm drinking. Well, we'd be doing that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she does. She truly appreciates this opportunity to be a stay-at-home mom, as she used to work 80-hour weeks as a lawyer. Oh, but after a conversation with Emily, who compliments Paul on looking so, so good, good, Miriam starts to wonder if Paul is maybe having an affair. And she pretty much turns any conversation she has with other people of their husband's actions into seeds of doubt in her own relationship. I mean, honestly, it got a little... It was annoying. It was. Mm -hmm. So when Paul turns down sex on her birthday, her worries of him having an affair really begin to escalate until she finally snoops on his computer 
and finds charges for an outrageously expensive throw blanket. And the blanket was not for her birthday. Nope. Do you find it interesting that a man cannot turn down sex because there's something wrong, but a woman can? Maybe he was tired. Maybe. I also want to mention that there were charges for primer and paint. Oh, yeah. A framing company and rent. Mm. Now that was the smoking gun that obviously proves he was cheating. Not so fast there, High Speed. Paul's secret is he was just trying to give Miriam back some of her independence and had set up an office for her to practice law part-time. Should she, you know, maybe want to go back to work? Kind of like our little 115 square foot studio space here. But it's a beautiful space. I know, I love it. Relief restored. They <sighs> finally, finally talk to each other and move forward stronger and with a much better understanding of their relationship. They will be just fine. Finally, let's talk about our last couple. Carolina mm. and the Senator Graham Hartwell. Ugh. Of all the relationships, this one was the one that appeared so perfect, but was so clearly built on lies, right? Yeah. I mean, Carolina, as successful as she was, in her mind, she was still just a poor girl from a small village in Poland and was completely swept off her feet by the well-connected Graham. I mean, they married six months after they met. And she became an instant mother to his two-year-old son, Harry. It's like a just-add-water relationship we hear about in the military. <laughs> but cracks start to appear when they find the house in Greenwich. Graham does not want Carolina's name on the deed, but she insists. And even though she has basically been the only mother to Harry... Uh, Graham continually drags his feet when she suggests adopting him. He clearly, I mean, to me at least, does not want to cement the relationship fully. Carolina tells Emily and Miriam that Graham has had affairs with other women in the past, but he always comes back. She really thinks Graham will come back when his affair with Reagan runs its course. But, I mean, the secret he's kept, that's what really breaks them. The vasectomy. Ugh. He stood by her side while she went through multiple rounds of IVF, herbs, acupuncture, Clomid, I think crystals too. Uh, yeah, I think so. Money was no object in her attempts of getting pregnant. Their relationship ends in divorce. I mean, after we learned all these secrets, it's kind of obvious. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Graham does try to come back, like the little snake he is, mm. just as Carolina thought he might. But she stands firm thank goodness, and the relationship remains dissolved. I think that just about wraps up the main characters and their relationships. So let's play a game. I'll call it the, the Notable Characters Game. It's a game when you don't have all day to discuss all the characters and the brandy is starting to go to your head. Perfect. So give a description, a quote, or a funny incident. If you guess incorrectly, you have to take a sip of this slushy goodness and then vice versa. You and your games. I already have some thoughts. Mm. I hope everybody is playing along too, and why well, take a sip if I miss? Let's just finish the pitcher. It is getting low anyways. Ugh, <laughs> I can already feel it. So I'm going to go first. Okay. This person says, yeah, dude, I'll just post an explanation that I was just having fun on New Year's. I mean, I don't have anything against Jews. My agent is Jewish. My accountant is Jewish. Hell, all my lawyers are Jewish. I'm not a hater. Hmm. That's, yeah, that's, uh, um, that's Rizzo, the pop star. Pop star Rizzo, yep. yep. You know, during my research, I read that Miss Weisberger is Jewish. I loved how she brought awareness to the anti-Semitism still out there. Heck, she even mentioned Charlottesville right down the road from us. Your turn. Yeah. You're, you're going to love this one, okay? <laughs> <laughs> this person gave a thumbs up after texting, you're not the only one who can Google... Easy breezy. Miles. Nope. Take a sip. You're thinking of the boob pic. I can't even believe that because mm. I'm not even allowed to send you a thumbs up mm. anymore. I knew the answer. It's Alistair. Uh, correct. I wanted to take a drink. <laughs> <laughs> you did. And speaking of thumbs up, guys, I can't even text Amy a thumbs up anymore in fear she will send me a nasty meme or worse. Don't tell him what I send you, though. No. So, no thumbs up emojis for me. Next one. This person was more worried about Graham's career than Harry's safety. That's an easy one. It has to be 
monster in law, Elaine. Yep. She's not even worth even additional mention. Barely. Okay. You're going to love this one. This person got caught wearing a blue glitter condom at Zach Anda's party. Oh, Lord. That was Cheater Eric. <laughs> I don't know who annoyed me more. Cheater Eric or his wife, Ashley. Ugh. They all have way too much money and a false sense of reality. Okay, so my turn. This person's life was full of loss. Loss of a mother, loss of friends, loss of a normal relationship mm -hmm. with the one person who could probably teach him how to be a man. Truly a loss of normal childhood. Even temporarily loses the one person who was always there for him. That's really sad. Mm -hmm. That's Harry. I felt so bad for him. Those formidable years were taken away from him. Agree. I was really glad Carolina was able to get him back. Okay, I got one for you. This person was coined as the Dalai Lama of blackmail, the grand dame of extortion, the priestess of... Has to be Miranda. Yeah, of course. I just love how Weisberger used her character to tighten up Emily's gig. Almost blackmailing Emily back to runway. What a powerful woman. So, I've got one more. This person was a good old boy, torn between brotherhood and doing the right thing. Hmm. Paul? I knew this one might throw you off. Take a gulp. Uh, okay. Hmm. I think you're going to have to give me more info than that. A few more gulps and we'll have to finish this episode though. <laughs> okay. So think about that sit down meeting in a restaurant during a long and monotonous sorry speech. I stood by him while he did these awful things to you. And I didn't know why out of some misguided sense of loyalty, maybe he was always there for me from the day we met as undergrads. When my parents died six months apart, when the twins were born prematurely and we spent weeks in the NICU, when Ellen left me, he's always been there for me. And I guess I thought I owed him for that word vomit. Ugh, of course. Graham's yep. lawyer trip. I can't believe I missed that. He's such a pig and he managed to turn it around on himself. Such a good old boy. Pfft, right. Fun game though, Amy. But... Let's move on to themes. What did you find? Now that our whistles are wet, there are several strong themes in this novel. I think we have already covered marriage and relationships during our dialogue with the main characters. I agree. So let's look at the themes of motherhood, strong women, body image, and materialism. Okay. I'll start with motherhood. So Emily easily has the biggest transformation in regards to this theme. Wouldn't you agree? Mm -hmm. She doesn't like kids. She is never going to have kids. Kids are just a complication in her mind. Her relationship with her own mother does not seem particularly healthy as the one mention we have of her is that Emily hates her. Very true. But I did sense a change in her when she spent the day with Miriam's daughter, Maisie, in the city. Mm. Now, granted, Emily took Maisie as a buffer for her meeting with Miranda <laughs> thinking it would make it much easier to manipulate her. Yeah, but that backfires, though, because Miranda brings Maisie right into her office, and Emily is the one who gets manipulated into spilling the dirt that ultimately brings down Graham. Right. But Maisie and Emily have a great day. Emily finds it to be one of the best girl days she's ever had. She does. I mean, Emily even acknowledges feeling protective love towards the little girl. And when she does learn she is pregnant and tries to take an Ambien, she has an image of an armless and legless baby, which prevents her from taking the pill. Well, I think when Emily finds out the baby is a girl, she is all in on motherhood. Maybe because of her connections with Maisie? Probably. I, she has certainly embraced all the changes to her body in pregnancy, which we see so clearly at her baby shower. You guys have got to read it for the delicious scene. It's so good. And she's over the moon excited to have a baby girl. This does not seem to complicate things at all. Miriam, moving on, has her own issues with motherhood. Her own mother is embarrassed by her and can't believe she gave up a successful career to raise her children. Well, it's impossible, Wendy, to be a good mother when you are working 80 hours a week. I think it's impossible to be even a good wife. 
<laughs> and she definitely does not want to be like her own mother who ignored her until she was in college. I remember getting my English degree, working full time, and practically being a single mom when my hubs was deployed. I cut out spending money on Prosecco to hire a housekeeper. So, you know, I would have more time with my son. It was just worth it. What a sacrifice. Now, Miriam acknowledges that she's bored sometimes as a stay-at-home mom, but she's not going to deny that she does love it. And as we said earlier, she is appreciative of it. We see moments with her children, a cuddle before bedtime, being a room mom, being able to give them experiences they would have never had in the city. Well, and then there was the garage full of toys, playing outside, meals together, you know, the school drop-off. She would have never been able to do any of this with her previous schedule. No. Mm -mm. And she is one of the few moms in the Burbs who doesn't have a nanny. And yet she's not completely fulfilled mm -mm. in this role. She feels guilty, too, for feeling this way. Mom guilt is real, I guess, huh? Yep, it is. She tells herself over and over that she is fortunate, and it's kind of sad she has to remind herself of this. But I think when Paul gives her the space to have her career, she becomes a better mother. Yes. She's, she is happier, and that happiness is passed on to her family. We all need a little something of our own. We do. Now, um, moving on, I think Carolina is the one who defines motherhood the best. Agree. She is willing to do anything for Harry. I mean, even if that means sacrificing herself, right? Mm -hmm. She has dirt on Graham, but the fact that it could hurt Harry, she's unwilling to go there. I mean, everything she does for Harry makes her a mother. Well, as Harry gets older, he becomes more curious about his mother as she died when he was only two. You know, Graham continuously puts off sharing the memories he has with Harry. Carolina understands the importance for Harry to know his mother and makes him a memory box. Oh, that was so, that was really sweet. Do you remember after Carolina is released from jail and she's at Elaine's house? Do you remember that mm -hmm. part? Right. So Elaine is more concerned about Graham's career in light of Carolina's DUI right. than Harry's safety. But we learned that Carolina's relationship with her own mother is very different from Miriam and Emily's respective mother-daughter relationship. It is. We learned that Carolina's mother worked as a nanny and spent six out of seven days raising another family's children. Right. So Carolina at the time, understandably so, mm -hmm. thought her mother loved the children she cared for more than Carolina herself. Sad but true. She did know her mother loved her and knew she wanted the best for her. Her mother encouraged Carolina to be a model. And her mom had the family she was working for check on the model scout to ensure it wasn't a scam. That's right. Carolina was raised mostly by her aunt Agata, who loved her dearly. But she was also very real with Carolina, warning her of Graham before they married. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Aunt Agata felt he wasn't a man to be trusted. She had a great intuition. But Carolina luckily had two great mothers growing up. Here's something of note, though. Uh, remember she harbored some resentment about her mother always having to leave? All oh, right. But she had an epiphany at Harry's swim meet. She wonders if Harry feels the same about seeing her at the swim meet as she felt about seeing her mom on Sunday mornings after being gone all week. Right. That I mean, was yeah. Very enlightening for her. And when she was having her final conversation with Graham, Harry comes in and asks why she's crying. What's wrong? She tells him it's because she's happy. And everything is exactly as it should be. And for her it is. Because all she ever wanted was to be a mother, and she is to Harry. There are so many other ways motherhood is woven through these women in the story. So please let us know what resonated with you. We'd love to hear it. I'd like to move on to the theme of strong women. Wendy, you're a strong woman. Why don't you get us started? I would love to. Now, this theme was very interesting to me because to go back to the man in the hole path we mentioned in the beginning, remember that? Mm -hmm. I felt each woman had in them already what made them strong, their self-identity, their purpose, but it was taken from them in the beginning and working together, they're able to rise up and become stronger than before. So let's look at Emily. She's an independent agent to the stars. She calls the shots. But when she heads to New York City to bail out a pop star, she is fired before she's hired. 
In fact, this is not the first client she has lost to the new and upcoming agent, Olivia Bell. But when Carolina asks her to help clear her name, Emily sees this as an opportunity to really launch her business again. Unfortunately, she alone is unable to give Carolina what she wants most. Miranda swoops in and gives Carolina what she desires most, her chance with Harry. And Emily even has to go back to work for Miranda in exchange for resolving the problem. Not that she asked for help. Mm -mm. Definitely one of Emily's lowest points. She feels, I mean, she really feels like a failure. I think she did too. Mm -hmm. But the irony is that of Emily becoming pregnant. Right. <laughs> she is now happy with herself and her changing body. But more on that when we talk about body image. Emily can now command her destiny as an in-demand agent to the stars again. And a posh mom at that. I, I feel not only was she happy, she sort of glorified. Mm -hmm, she did. <laughs> Now, Miriam, moving on, has her own man in the hole path. She was a very successful lawyer. Duh. She made partner at the most prestigious law firm in the city at age 34. Gosh, I think I was selling free popcorn at the O Club on Friday nights at Fort <laughs> Rucker, Alabama at 34 years of age. Well, I did it until I was caught. Oops. <laughs> Just kidding. I did that in my 20s, though. I'm sure you did. But don't they know it goes to a good cause, helping the Army I spouse? I gave the money back. I did. I bought all the single soldiers beers with that money. You're such a good Army spouse. Mm. But let's go back to Miriam's success story, not yours. She was also the editor of the Harvard Law Review. I would say that's definitely successful. She was. But... She didn't want to miss out on any more milestones for her kids. So when the opportunity arises for her to stay home, she quits her job and does just that. However, this seems to do more to fuel her insecurities, don't you think? Yeah, I agree. I mean, she worries about her weight, mm -hmm. and she's insecure around the other Greenwich ladies, and she even starts to believe Paul is cheating on her. If only she would just have a conversation with him and stop listening to all these meddling mommy. <laughs> she is definitely not fitting into the suburban mommy mold. And we shouldn't be trying to fit into a mold. Mm -mm. I mean, it's only when she stoops to snooping in Paul's email and finds the charge for rent that she finally confronts him. You know, I've never had the desire to snoop. Me neither. I'm too tired. Really, I am too. <laughs> but, or reading. <laughs> exactly. But you know, Paul notices um, her unhappiness and he rents and remodels her an office to practice law. Ah, it's just amazing. It is. You know, she makes new friends, she loses weight, spices up their sex life, and you know, is overall just a happy mommy. Her life is now in a perfect balance. It is. Now, Carolina was independent and successful at a very early age as a young model. But when she married Graham, she was swept up into his lifestyle. She was no longer Carolina, the world-famous model. She was Carolina, the senator's wife. And you know, it makes me think sometimes in the military, we can kind of get caught up in our husbands sure. and forget that we are our own separate identity. I mean, she really lost her own identity to Graham, wouldn't you say? I would say that. Mm -hmm. He controlled everything whether it was adopting Harry or the ability to conceive a child. Oh, yeah. And the secret vasectomy. Ugh. When Carolina learns of the snip-snip-sizzle-clip, this is when she kind of decides to grow a pair of her own. Mm-hmm. Go, you girl. Know, she's so angry when she learns of this information. She tells Miriam that she needs to prepare for jail. You know, she says, I'm going to find a knife and cut the balls off that mother. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> we get it. She's hot. Luckily, her friends talk her down because she doesn't need any jail time. And here comes the moment when she finally, she's finally ready to stand up for herself. She's down with Emily's plan. Graham is taken down. I loved it. Mm -hmm. Carolina gets primary custody of Harry and even lands a job at Runway. She continues the legacy of strong women in her family. You want to do a speed round with our last couple of themes? Sure. I feel we can wrap up body image and materialism, those were huge in this novel, right. would you say, together as these two themes go hand in hand. And then we can finally bring in these fun titles. Oh, yes. How about I say a title and then you tell me whether it's materialism, body image, or both. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So first one, first title, Living the Dream. Oh, okay. That has to be materialism. For sure. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a little bit of body image in that one too. 
right? Uh, I, I would agree with that. Okay. Yeah. I've got one. Just give up. I have. <laughs> <laughs> I know this. You do. Definitely body image. <laughs> right. <laughs> With COVID-19, I kind of gave up there for a while, but I'm coming back strong. Same. Yeah, yeah I'm trying. 5K. I right. know you're on the bridge to 10. <laughs> okay, my turn. Happy to sip and not see. Oh, huge body image. And some materialism. Okay. <laughs> Here's one. The suburbs make you fat. Duh. Body image. Yep. Mm-hmm. I'm feeling a little chubby right now with the COVID-19 <laughs> again. Yeah, it's catching up with us. Okay. We're working on it. So so I've got one for you. Mom's night out. That one, that's materialism mm -hmm. big, right? Mm -hmm. But I felt there was a little body image mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. This one. Pinterest mom of the year. Oh, that's another one that is both materialism and body image. For sure. Okay. So here's one. Sorry, mom. Home to the custom fit vagina. <laughs> well, obviously we have body image with that, mm -hmm. but you know, secondary materialism fits there so that you can make yourself perfect and pay for it. Right. How about this one? The cocaine of the kindergarten set. Hmm. Huh. Cocaine of the kindergarten set. Okay, I'm gonna have to say materialism. And body image. Yep. Okay. I mean, it's just, you know, it's interwoven. Yeah. Man, these two themes are so tightly interwoven. Um, let's just do one more. Okay. Let's do the last chapter. Goodbye, wheatgrass. Hello, sarcasm. Well, if we're taking wheatgrass, obviously there's some body image in mm -hmm. there. But I feel like just the fact that you would be saying you're doing wheatgrass has to go with materialism. Mm -hmm. I mean, these chapter titles. Oh, delicious. The best. How she came up with them, I have no idea, but I loved every so single creative. one of them. One final note on materialism. The name dropping in this book really cements its place oh, in time. yeah. Right? Oh. All right. <sighs> that was fun. It was fun. Moving on. I'm feeling this slush. I'm feeling this slush, too. Let me have some more slush. I'm thinking we might have to retape this thing. I don't think so. It's a summer beachy read. We it's don't care. It's a summer beachy read. Mm. Moving on. Moving on. Okay. Amy, you seem to be able to make a symbol out of anything. So I would love to hear your take on some of the symbols. Well, for the purposes of time, I think we should cover only a couple and then let our friends talk about the others with us on our social media. Okay. So first and foremost, the champagne bottles. Ugh. Too bad they weren't Prosecco bottles. It would have been so ironic for us, right? Right. About those bottles, though. So, in my past literary studies of psychological criticism, I recall studying symbology using the Freudian perspective. Of course, the sexuality side of the criticism, you know, the phallic and the yonic. Mm -hmm. We mentioned the word phallic in episode two, speech sounds, but we didn't elaborate for our listeners who might never have heard or had the desire to know this term. So the empty champagne bottles are a male phallic symbol. Right. Phallic meaning convex or where the length exceeds diameter, sort of like trees bottles, tall buildings. Or a man's genitalia. Exactly. So you do remember studying this. Hmm? I'm trying to remember. And Carol, please close your ears. Where I'm going with this, Wendy, is the bottles are a symbol of Graham's overzealous sex drive and infidelity in the past, present, and future. Oh. We all know he planted the bottles there. Right. But it's these bottles that represent his past discretions and the current Reagan Whitney Trist. Huh. That's really interesting. And it's so odd, too, because didn't Carolina say that they didn't even like champagne? Well, I'm sure they were bottles he and Reagan enjoyed together. But no, Carolina didn't like champagne. However, these empty bottles represented their empty relationship and the fact that there was never going to be a sparkle between them again. And you know, he will not change in the future either. Ugh. No. I mean, he's made it this far. Mm -hmm. 
I feel too, the emptiness in those bottles also represents the ability to not give Carolina children because of his betrayal of the vasectomy. Oh, you're right. He was literally shooting empty blanks. (sighs) I'd like to take the next one if I may. Okay. Let's look at athleisure wear. You know, the Lululemons, the namesake of the title. I'm wearing them right now. I have never understood the hefty price for Lululemon's tire, especially the type the type that is so stretchy and doesn't let you know that you are painlessly muffining over the top. It's like a trap. <laughs> Thank goodness they give the military a hefty discount. Very thankful for all of our businesses that support these men and women who are fighting for it. Oh, me too. You know, with all this social distancing and in a sense, lockdown, we will all need to sign up for Ashley's cosmetic surgery plan or train for a Miriam comeback marathon. <laughs> You know, I have to try on jeans or button pants every now and then to make sure I can still fit into my regular clothes. I did it today, Mm -hmm. and I didn't even have to lay on the bed to button them. Well, it's all that yoga you've been doing in your hot apartment. (laughs) That's so we can do hot yoga. (sighs) Now, I'm going to have to say, I could have contributed to the empty champagne bottle collection of Senator Hartwell's. You know, speaking of lots of alcohol, which is both a theme and a symbol in Lulu... Let me tangent for a moment. I took down some information from the Google webs. Mm. I read in New York Daily News um, an article that showed liquor sales were up 75%, (laughs) wine 66%, and beer 42% when compared to this time last year. Online alcohol orders saw a 243% increase. Wow. Guys, please be careful. Just drink Prosecco. Just. It's a bubbly and it's effervescent. Delicious. Well, they did deem liquor stores to be essential and remain open. So, I mean, we need it. It's essential for us. Mm -hmm. So everyone in Greenwich wore the expensive Lululemons. They were a symbol of all the wives who didn't have to work. Their significant others made so much money that these ladies were able to afford a closet full. Name brand is everything in the burbs. It so coincides with the theme of materialism. One more symbol that is also a part of the setting at the end of the novel that might easily get missed is Miriam's office. Oh, I was thinking about that pricey throw, but I like the office as an overarching symbol. Now hold on to the thought of that blanket throw for a second. Okay. Um, I had initially thought of that too, but the office so represented the infidelity that was not there. Let me dig deep here. Okay. The office was a real thing, just like the loyalty in their marriage. Does that make sense? It does, actually. Okay. It showed us that not all marriages are doomed. And moreover, it showed that keeping it spicy doesn't always have to involve sex. Right. I just, I loved how Paul tended to all little details and needs inside the office It's the little things that matter in life. You know, the office, Paul's secret. It just, it only served to demonstrate his attentiveness in showing that he was attuned to Miriam needs. He knew what she wanted and needed. Exactly. He respected her as a mother. Oh, he so did. And he respected that she had a career and that that career was important to her. I agree. He realized that she sacrificed an important part of her life to move to the Burbs. And he wanted to give her you know, to have a part of herself back. The office sounded so incredible. The lighting, the paint, the furniture, and that throw blanket, it just sounded so lush. It was a symbol in itself. You know, it really represented Paul's love and warmth towards Miriam and showed that paying attention to the little details in life really matters the most. It just did. There were tons of symbols in this novel, weren't there? Oh yeah, absolutely. We could go on forever. We could. I mean, we can anyways, but (laughs) we'd just love to hear about some of the other ones that you guys found. So hit us up on any of our social media platforms and tell us what you found and how it stood out to you. So, Wendy, final thoughts on this book? Uh, We went pretty deep for what I call a beach read. Right. I'm sure most people don't take their beach read and dive into it like Mm -mm, this. But There's no way. Wasn't it fun to dive in deep to a pop culture fiction? Absolutely. There really is so much to learn. Love yourself. Be content. You are enough. You are enough. You are. Mm. I think we've covered it. Amy? We certainly have. Now, we have a request of our listeners now that we have a couple episodes under our belt. We do. 
we would ask that you share our podcast with at least one person who loves to read. We are trying to truly grow our listenership and get more folks who really love to read literature. You can hit us up on our social media platforms or leave us any comments, questions, or thoughts in our sparkling wine box at prosecco.prose at gmail.com. Now let's look at some of our listener comments from our sparkling wine box. Got an email from Karen B. She said, love your podcast. Oh, I love to hear that. I have been looking for a true book study and will continue to listen. I really loved your discussion of the Bog Girl's smile as an arc in the story. I felt like I was back in college studying literature. Doesn't that make you feel good? It does. Yeah. So she says, help bring back the love of short stories. People forget about them. Well, just think a short story you can digest in an hour or so. Absolutely. So Karen, our plan is to do a novel and then follow with a short story. But I love poetry. So we may even add a few episodes with a few pieces of poetry here and there too. So let us know what you want to read. Wendy, you received a request for some of the terms we use that folks may not remember from their school days. Yes. um, We can't assume that everyone who likes to read has a degree in English. Mm -mm. Or if they do, even remembers all those little literary terms. So many. I have a book that's like a thousand pages of them. Bedford. Mm -hmm. Bedford. Bedford. So we had a request to do a short episode on literary terms when we were using our episodes. So do you think we could handle a 10-minute episode, Amy? Sure, I think we can do that, but can we make it funny? I love literary comedy. I know. I think we can come up with something. Maybe we'll put a fun military spouse spin to it with some stories from our past duty stations. What do you think about that? Oh, that would be fun. I bet our civilian population of listeners would get a kick. Not more so than our fellow male spouses, though. (laughs) Right. So thanks so much for expressing your thoughts. We definitely look forward to hearing from you. So, Wendy... That's a wrap for this bonus episode of Prosecco and Prose. Thank you again for joining us for this episode of Prosecco and Prose. Please subscribe to our podcast wherever you download all your favorite podcasts. We would love to hear your reviews or special requests on future pieces of prose. We want to hear your voice as this is your book club. You can also send your questions and comments to prosecco.pros at gmail.com. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at PNPros. And on Instagram at Prosecco and Pros. Find and friend us on Facebook. Just plug in Prosecco space, capital N space, Pros. I'm Amy. And I'm Wendy, signing off as our bottle of bubbly is now empty. See you for our next episode. And in the meantime, pop a cork and read. read.